Hello and welcome to Continental Prime, coming to you live from our studio in Lagos, Nigeria. I am Benga Aborowa, and these are the headlines. Over 200 homes destroyed after rainstorms in Liberia Township. Nigeria's military chiefs appear before lawmakers over rising insecurity. And the Ethiopian parliament classifies Tigray People's Liberation Front as a terrorist organization. We'll bring you all the details shortly. We begin the news in the Republic of South Africa, where factional battles within South Africa's ruling party, ANC, spilled over into the country's parliament today when President Cyril Ramaphosa was asked about his party status. Ramaphosa today joined a hybrid setting of the National Assembly in Parliament to respond to questions for oral reply and COVID-19 and vaccines, amongst others. But instead of dealing with the martyr's hand, Ramaphosa was forced to address the issues of the factional battles. Ramaphosa has been caught in a power struggle with Secretary General Ace Magashule, who yesterday issued a letter of suspension to the party's president. The suspension comes after the ANC affirmed a resolution this week that senior leaders facing charges of corruption needed to step aside until their cases are finalised. The party had suspended Magashule for failing to step aside amidst corruption charges against him. But in a fight back campaign, Magashule suspended Ramaphosa. To help us unpack this issue, we have political analyst Ongama Ntimka on the line with us this evening. Uh, good evening, Ongama. Now, Mr. Ramaphosa did not respond to the questions about these factional battles he's facing in the ANC. Was he really obliged to answer the questions? Well, to the extent that South Africa's executive is derived from the majority party in parliament, I think it was only fair for MPs to ask the question, even though it doesn't relate to matters of state, so the president he, 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 he could evade that question. Uh, so so, so uh, I think it's an important one because we base, uh, sorry, the executive is derived from parliament, uh, the majority party, given the fact that we have a closed party list uh, as, a, as a country. So, so it was only fair for MPs to ask but also there is no way they could have expected the president to want to entertain that uh, discussion in the parliamentary platform. OK, understood that uh, it was there to talk about vaccines and COVID-19 response. But this week we've seen factional battles unfold very publicly. Should Ramaphosa make some form of public statement to address what's really happening in the party? Maybe not on the floor of parliament, but in other areas should do does he need to make a statement so there's a lot that relies so first of all south africa has got a majority party so it's the kind of system uh, that is characterized by a dominant uh, a governing party with the anc having more than uh, 57 percent of uh, the votes in the national assembly so markets will be interested and stakeholders outside of uh, the real politic in the country will be interested in terms of what is happening and what his view is on the developments precisely because um, they want to get a sense from senior levels of government as to how secure the current administration is and you will bear in mind, Benga, that this current administration of uh, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa campaigned on a ticket of ridding South Africa of state capture and corruption. corruption. And as such, is watched as an important uh, development within the party when there are developments that show that they are now finally committing to cleaning up 
uh, uh, within the ANC. Uh, they, what the president's strategy has been, though, is that he wants to have enough uh, uh, room for plausible deniability by having some of the senior uh, leaders in government and in the ruling party speak on his behalf without him actually being drawn to the debate publicly in ways that could compromise whatever stance he wants to take at the uh, party uh, internal party meetings because he's had a demeanor of being a collaborator and a cooperator with the various camps and only acting um, only when there is a very clear uh, direction which he has canvassed successfully at a meeting. So he's not at home driving uh, his, his own uh, messaging on public platforms, especially in times when it is very divisive. Now, Ongama, the ANC's highest decision-making body, the ANC Executive Committee, is meeting this weekend. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be keen to know what's going to happen, what decisions will be taken. Can you take us through what is likely going to be discussed at the meeting? So there are two camps within the National Executive Committee and, in fact, throughout the structures of the governing party, uh, even at a subnational level. There's the camp that is pro the rule of law, uh, that is led by President Cyril Ramaphosa, oppositions itself as being pro rule of law. And then there's the one that feels that the rule of law should, should be subject to the politics of the day. So political imperatives, as far as they are concerned, should actually be subject to, sorry, should, should be preeminent over issues of constitutionalism and the rule of law. Now, we have seen that during the former president Jacob Zuma's reign, they attempted to collapse the capabilities of law enforcement institutions to be able to act independently. Pursuant to this idea that uh, those institutions needed to, to accede to the political imperatives of the day. So leading to this, to this NEC meeting, uh, are two opposing ideas. One that seeks to consolidate the rules-based engagement, which started uh, about nine uh, or eight years ago, uh, and is sought as a mechanism to try and rid the party of corrupt elements, while others want to stymie it. The pro it, it is reflected in a proxy battle uh, between the, ACE, uh, the, the, the Secretary General, uh, Ace Mahashule, and those that are opposed to him. Uh, and, and, and so far, President Cyril Ramaphosa has had a stronger grip on uh, the higher echelons of power within the ANC, the National Executive Committee, the top six officials, as well as the National Working Committee. And so far, there's been a number of uh, successive decisions made by those structures which appear to be in favor of President Cyril Ramaphosa. So come the weekend, we don't expect that there's going to be a fundamental now, departure from that general trend. Now, there's a saying that a house divided cannot stand on its own. We've seen this fight uh, play out in public, and this is an election year. Do you think the opposition, the EFF, the Democratic Alliance and other opposition parties will take advantage of this infighting within the ruling African National Congress. Perhaps the EFF might. The EFF is on the left of the ANC. Um, and then you have the Democratic Alliance, which is on the right of the ANC. Um, but it is facing its own implosion. So I doubt that it's going to be able uh, to, 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 to capitalize on the loss of support that the ANC is having. Uh, for as far as the ANC is concerned, I think that we've gotten to a stage where these divisions, in fact, uh, it's okay that they have been triggered within the party because coming out of the conference that elected President Cyril Ramaphosa as the president of the party, the, the ANC came as two organizations in one and there was hope that these two would mend and, and, and forge unity go, uh, since then. Mm. However, the exact opposite happened because the Secretary General, for example, vowed back in that time already that he was going to be only five years 
and power was going to be wrestled out of uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa's control. So there's been a long drawn out latent conflict that has been underlying. And that it is now playing out in the open can only bode well for the party, especially for those that want to rebuild okay. on a more solid ground, mm -hmm. given the fact that the, the stalemate has been debilitating to those that want to drive an agenda of reform. We definitely ha have a lot unfolding uh, with regards to the ruling ANC in South Africa. I'd like to say a big thank you to you, um, Ongama Mtimka, for your time. Thanks for joining us on Continental Pro <laughs> this evening. Thank, thank you, Ben. Ongama Mtinka there, joining us live from South Africa, a political analyst. We now head to East Africa where the debate on the constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 has ended in the Senate and voting is underway. This comes as a section of senators continue to push for an amendment to the document to realign with the constitution. While Senate Speaker Kenneth Lusaka says no amendments were proposed in the second stage, amendments have been proposed by the Committee of the Whole. He assured the House a ruling will be made before the Committee of the Whole stage. Amongst its most prominent proposals are changes in the structure of the executive and the legislature, with the creation of a premier and two deputies from the majority party in Parliament. Johnny Jackson, Honorable Lentoimanga Alois Musa, Honorable Leonard Yegon Brighton, Honorable Leshomo Maison, Honorable Lesonet Moses. I'm Jackson Legumandare, MB Samburu East. I fought yes. Mushma Lesomo, Samburu County, member of BBI. I fought yes. And from East Africa, we head to West Africa, where Nigeria's head of security, defense, and intelligence agencies appeared before the nation's Senate in an effort to reveal ongoing strategies aimed at tackling an escalating insecurity crisis. The service chiefs, accompanied by senior officers from the various security agencies, spent well over four hours in a closed-door session with lawmakers in the nation's capital, Abuja. New Central's correspondent, Amadine Uyi, gives an update of what transpired during plenary. The service chiefs arrived at the National Assembly in the company of other senior officers. They were ushered into plenary in the presence of lawmakers to give an update on the security situation in the country. On behalf of all of us, the single senators, I want to welcome this team. And let me quickly assure all of you that indeed this Senate, or even the entire National Assembly, is and will remain a partner in progress with you. The President of the Senate, Ahmad Lawad, thanked the chiefs for the efforts they have put so far and the sacrifices they have made in tackling insecurity. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to commend our armed forces and other security agencies for fighting the myriad of security challenges across the country in the process some have given up their lives others are maimed we appreciate what you are doing because we know that you are doing your best with what you have at hand after over a four hours closed door session, the President of the Senate disclosed what transpired behind closed doors. On behalf of all the services, that is Chief of Army staff, Chief of Naval staff, Chief of Air staff, 
and Director General National Intelligence Agency, National Intelligence Agency, NIA, no, Defense Intelligence Agency, on their plans of continuing, containing the present insecurity situation in the country. Thereafter, they answered questions from distinguished senators bordering on security, insurgency, terrorism, kidnapping, and other topical national security matters of interest to the parliament. Is this a true reflection of what transpired in the close, in the close session? Thank you very much. With the intervention from the Senate, Nigerians will be hoping for a change in the current insecurity crisis. From Abuja, Amadin Uyi, New Central Television. Now, heavily armed criminal gangs have become an increasing security threat in northwestern central Nigeria, rustling castle, cattle and kidnapping for ransom. Recently, they have turned their focus to rural schools and universities where they abduct students. About 40 students kidnapped by gunmen from the Federal College of Forestry Mechanization, Kaduna State in northwest Nigeria, have been freed after spending nearly two months in captivity. The abduction is one of a series of mass kidnappings to hit schools in Nigeria since late last year. It is freedom at last for the remaining 29 students of the Federal College of Forestry Mechanization, Kaduna State, after they were released on Wednesday. It has been 55 days of agony, horror, and pain for these students who are in the captivity of bandits. In the early hours of March 11, gunmen had invaded the institution and abducted 39 students. Allegedly, over 200 students and staffs would have been captured. But a student who cited the bandits raised an alarm, while soldiers in the area promptly responded to a distress call and engaged the bandits in the gunfight. Before their release, the bandits had released videos in which they had made some demands and threatened to kill the students. My name is Benson Emmanuel. Please, we are begging on our parents, please, for my help us out of here. We've stayed here, we've stayed here for days, we have not been eaten, most of us have been sick. Okay. My name is Shahaya Paul. I'm from mm -hmm. Federal Forest Farm Organization. Please, you are calling on our parents to help us to come and take us out of here. They should try their possible best. I made heightened calls for their release by the parents of the victims. I know if you talk with my boy. I know if you look at uh, Help us. I beg to help us. Help us. <laughs> The abductors had demanded 500 million naira ransom from the Kaduna state governor. But Governor Nasir el Urvai ruled out the option of negotiation, saying the government will not be compelled to abandon its no ransom, no negotiation policy. Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Kaduna State, Samuel Arouan. Students of Federal College of Forestry uh, Mechanization are here with, with us. Like you know, uh, they need to undergo a thorough uh, medical uh, examination. But by the special grace of God, uh, we will meet you uh, tomorrow, Thursday, for a detailed briefing. The students were later released in three batches in a space of one month, five on April the 5th, five on April 8th, and 29 on March 5th. Meanwhile, students of Greenfield University in Kaduna are still in captivity. Kaduna Police PRO Mohamed Jalinge says the students underwent a routine medical checkup and will be handed over to their parents. Coming up on NZ Continental Prime, United Nations expresses concern over security situation in Tigray. We'll bring you details of this story and more after the break. Stay with us.
You're welcome back. Now, close to 200 homes have been destroyed and more than a dozen people are injured after rainstorms swept through Plain, a Liberian township on the border with Guinea on Wednesday night. Among the injured is an 11-year-old girl who sustained a fractured leg when a wall collapsed on her. The local township authorities have put out an appeal for humanitarian assistance. Desperate residents phoned into radio programs in Monrovia on Thursday explaining the situation and calling on the national government to move in with help. We now move to East Africa, Ethiopia, where the parliament has endorsed the recent cabinet decision to classify the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, as a terrorist organization. The resolution, which was unanimously passed by ruling party MPs also includes the Oromo Liberation Army, an armed group active in the Oromia and Amhara regions. The TPLF dominated Ethiopia's ruling coalition between 1991 and 2018 when Abiy Ahmed was appointed prime minister. Ethiopia's Attorney General Gideon Timoteos says ordinary citizens will not be affected by the new measure, while warning potential foreign countries to collaborate with the two groups. Staying in Ethiopia, Ethiopia's Ministry of Health registered 785 new COVID-19 cases in the past 24 hours, taking the nationwide tally to 260,139. The ministry says 23 new deaths from coronavirus were reported across the country during the same period, bringing the national debt toll to 3,795. The East African country reported 729 more COVID-19 recoveries, taking the national count to 203,408. Ethiopia, Africa's second most populous nation, has reported the highest number of COVID-19 cases in the East Africa region. The ministry adds that Ethiopia has 52,934 active COVID-19 cases, of whom 785 are said to be under severe health conditions. Prime in Waldrap, at least 25 people killed, including a police officer, in a shootout in Rio de Janeiro. We'll bring you details of this story and more after the break. Join us again. You're welcome back in Waldrap, at least 25 people, including a police officer, have been killed in a shootout in Rio de Janeiro. The shootout took place during a police operation in a favela in the Jassa Rezinha area of the city. Civil police launched the operation after receiving reports that drug traffickers were recruiting children for their gang. Two passengers on a metro train were hit by bullets but survived. Police in, Brazilian, in the Brazilian city confirmed the death of one of their officers. Police Chief Ronald Oliveira says Thursday's raid was the largest number of deaths in a police operation in Rio. Not next is business news. Now in business, South Africa has recorded some progress in private sector activities. Tolu Adele Rubalogun tells us more on that and other stories. Welcome to Business on NC Continental Prime. We start in West Africa, where Nigeria's central bank has announced that it will continue an incentive program indefinitely. The program's aim is to boost dollar remittances into Africa's largest economy. The initiative rewards recipients with five naira for every one dollar they receive through licensed international money transfer operators and commercial banks. It launched in March and was initially scheduled to end May the 8th. The main purpose of the scheme was to encourage recipients of dollars to use formal banking channels and help the central bank capture such inflows to boost the stability of the local currency, which has been under pressure after oil prices plunged last year. The Naira has been devalued three times since 2020 after a sharp drop in oil earnings. Oil revenue accounts for 90 percent of foreign exchange inflows and remittances from workers abroad led to a dollar crunch in the West African nation. 
New research from MasterCard shows that the adoption of new payment technologies in Kenya, such as cryptocurrency, is rising, and consumer appetite for new, fast, and flexible digital experiences continues to grow. The MasterCard New Payments Index shows 99% of Kenyan consumers will consider using at least one emerging platform method, such as cryptocurrency, biometrics, contactless, or QR code, in the next year. Raghai Prasad, Division President, MasterCard Sub-Saharan Africa, said that the world as we know it has changed dramatically since the outbreak of the pandemic, accelerating long-term shifts in consumer transaction and payment methods. He said that the company would continue to work with merchants, fintechs, and banking partners to rapidly innovate payment options that meet consumer needs while ensuring it drives financial and digital inclusion. Total Energy Group, owner and operator of Block 17 in Angola, together with the Angolan National Oil and Gas and Biofuels Agency, has announced the start of production from Zinia Phase 2 short cycle project connected to existing past floors floating production storage and offloading unit. The project includes the drilling of nine wells and is expected to reach a production of 40,000 barrels of oil per day by mid-2022. Located in water depths from 600 to 1,200 meters and about 150 kilometers from the Angolan coast, Zinia Phase 2 resources are estimated at 65 million barrels of oil. Block 17 is operated by Total with a 38% stake alongside Equinor, which 22.16% uh, stake. ExxonMobil has 19% stake with BP Exploration Angola Limited holding 15.84% and Sanangol PNP holding 5%. The contractor group operates four floating production, storage and offloading units in the main production areas of the block. The private sector in South Africa has recorded some positive growth. The April headline PMI reading is the highest since March 2012. The details in this report. South African private sector activity has expanded at its strongest rate in nine years this past April. IHS Market Purchasing Managers Index PMI rose to 53.7 in April from 50.3 in March, staying above the 50 level that indicates an expansion. No. Pan-African media explains what led to the growth. I think uh, we we'll all understand that the pandemic disrupted uh, the economic activity last year. It's on the rise, confidence is beginning to improve, you know, and uh, export demand is also happening. So we'll see that firms are beginning to open up even as they adhere to the, to the uh, COVID-19 regulations, but firms are ready to go back to business. Mm. and economic activities obviously will improve. IHS market said firms indicated that demand had improved strongly at the start of the second quarter. But South Africa has a significant decline in her working population. While Africa's most industrialized economy employ other Africans to meet her labor needs. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a leading country on the continent, South Africa has improved in its policy and it's also improving in its policy day after day. I don't think South Africa as a, as a country will shut it, its doors to other African countries, especially if they are bringing in skills. In fact, uh, there are policies that are in place that uh, skills are needed. And if you go through the right channel, uh, you 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 will be able to do your business whether in the private or, or, or in the private sector. Let's stick to that. The road is becoming clearer, and the various activities of the Cyril Ramaphosa government seems destined to bring South Africa out of recession and to more prosperity. And finally, Canadian miner Lucara Diamond Core has secured credit approved commitments for senior debt facilities of up to $220 million to fund the underground expansion of its caraway mine in Botswana. And this will allow the operation to continue until at least 2040. The facilities will include project financing of $170 million for the underground project and working capital of $50 million for the ongoing operation of the Caraway Open Pit Mine. Now, the underground expansion has an estimated capital cost of $514 million and a five-year development period. 
The Caraway Diamond Mine is one of the world's highest margin diamond mines. In over eight years of production, it has yielded four of the 10 largest diamonds in recorded history, including the 1,758 carat Suelo, the largest diamond recovered from Botswana, and the 1,109 Lesedi Larona, which sold for $53 million. And that's business on NC Continental Prime. My name is Solulakwe Adela Rubalogo. It's Banks of Benga now. Uh, residents of the River Rhine Buruku community in Nigeria's North Central have been providing an alternative crossing for commuters as the bridge upstream has become unreliable. Wooden canoes and makeshift barges are the means of transportation for travellers and motor vehicles across the river Katsina Ala at the Buruku crossing. Today on Jami Yangu, News Central's Charles Haruka explores the unique business of maritime transportation in this rural community in Benue State. Traffic on the bridge over River Katsinala, a tributary of the River Benue, one of Nigeria's major rivers, is very scanty. This is quite strange for the only route linking the northeastern states of Adamawa and Taraba with the southern parts of the country. The bridge, located along the federal highway in Katsinala town of Benue State in the north central, has been undergoing rehabilitation after years of dilapidation. About a hundred nautical miles further downstream, Buruku, a river Rhine community, takes advantage of the out-of-commission bridge to provide an alternative crossing. At the place where the river bisects this community, crossing is by crudely constructed wooden canoes and makeshift ferry boats. It's better and it's shorter for me. That's the sincere truth. The Casinala Road is really bad. If it's fixed, okay, but if it's not, this particular lane is shorter and easier. Now, as you can see behind me, those are the canoes that are used to ferry human beings and sometimes farm produce from this side of the river to the other side. Now, not only human beings, but sometimes even light vehicles like motorcycles are some of the passengers that are ferried by these canoes. Now, if you follow me to the other side, you'll notice that there is a motor vehicle on that particular barge. Well, this is what they are. These are the barges that are used to ferry heavier vehicles like motor cars and buses, and of course, human passengers as well. We have different types of boats operating here. We have uh, smaller boats which uh, um, used to close uh, passengers and the uh, motorcycle. And then we have this uh, local wooden ferry that uh, ferry vehicles across this river. That is how we organize the closing. Apparently, the incapacity of the bridge over River Katsinala is now providing a source of livelihood for the youths of the Buruku Riverside community. The small one we charge a percent is 100 naira each head. And the one that is taking vehicles, these are like motors. Like this very one has just arrived now. We can charge this one 1,500 naira. It is private. But the, the commercial one is mainly is normally collected 1,200 naira, just like this one that's just arrived now. So I'm standing here on the one with uh, my brother Ku that uh, bring the idea of constructing this uh, local boat in the year 2002. When I, well, when I reached home, then I slept and I think over it. So the following day, I met our car carpenter, which used to construct small boats for us, that I want to construct a ferry boat that can ferry vehicles across. Because since that time, any time ve small vehicle come, we lift the vehicle and then roll inside the boat. When we leave this side, then we overload it by hand. Then 
finally, when we finally construct this one, the very one that you are seeing, and then we make it possible for the vehicle to be climbing by itself without lifting it for, uh, with hand. So how does it feel sailing across the river on one of these contraptions? Well, I decide to take a trip on one of the makeshift wooden barges. Unlike most of the other passengers, I insist on using a life jacket. This basic safety precaution is certainly not being taken. I would even prefer that if government can provide life jackets for every uh, boat user here to buy one before you board, it would be nice. Some passengers, they felt maybe giving the life jacket now, they don't see no need of using the life jacket. But it's very, very important. That's why they brought them here. But some of the passengers, when giving them the life jacket, you know, the life jacket were donated by two parties, APC and PDP. So when you give the one of PDP to a, a person of PDP now, they will be feeling maybe you are intimidating he or she. Then that's why we stop giving them the life jacket. Despite the risk involved, including the occasional capsizing of vessels and the attendant loss of life, the business continues to flow, literally. Lurking right round the corner is the perceived threat to the Riverine community's livelihood, an ultra-modern metallic ferry that's capable of carrying the number of vessels it would take 20 of the wooden barges to convey. The, the world is going into a modern uh, culture, which by having that vessel, maybe the fate is going to consume or maybe take, uh, because it takes up to the small vehicles, it takes up to seven, eight. So by the time you load on one way, the fear maybe you are going to block them from what they are supposed to get. The owner of the ferry, who himself is a native of the community, took time to explain how his vessel could pioneer something bigger for the community with the right kind of support. But for us to make that place becomes a good place and people should have free and more safety on the vessel. So that was my thinking, and I thought it's a better way for us to move forward. We can still apply to federal government to give us more small barges, I mean the canoes and the rest of them. They have it there. They're just dumb there. Nobody's using it. And I, I wanted them, if they could join up, we'll go have better ones, better flying boats. They are all there laying. Nobody is using it. There is so much potential for the Buruku River Rhine community providing this alternative crossing point with government facilitating the use of modernized vessels here. It would not only take the pressure off a rehabilitated bridge, it would also create a booming inland maritime industry for the community. For Jami Yangu, Charles Eruka, News Central Television. Now from Jamiangu, we sail to sports where the Europa League is ongoing with the number of African stars in action. Udoka, what's the latest on that and in the world of sport? Well, uh, talking about the Europa League now, currently Manchester United and Roma are playing a two-all draw. And with that uh, result so far, uh, of course, uh, Manchester United will go to the finals of the competition. But Arsenal are currently playing a goalless draw with Villarreal, and if it stands this way, of course, Arsenal will crash out and Villarreal will get to meet Manchester United in the finals of the Europa League. But then in other news concerning sports, let's talk about Pfizer and uh, its German partner, BioNTech. They said that they will donate doses of their COVID-19 vaccine to help vaccinate athletes and the delegations participating in the Tokyo Olympic Games and, of course, the Paralympic Games. The company said the initial doses are expected to be delivered to participating delegations at the end of May, with the goal of ensuring the delegations receive second doses before their arrivals in Tokyo. The plan was put into effect after the International Olympic Committee had a meeting with the Japanese government following Pfizer CEO Albert Bola's offer to donate vaccines to athletes and their delegations. 
Japan is considering extending the coronavirus spread state of emergency in Tokyo and other major urban areas. Sources are reported this on Wednesday and finding concerns about whether the Tokyo Olympics scheduled to begin on the 23rd of July could be held as planned. Moving straight to female football now, nine-time African champions Nigeria will be one of four participating teams at this year's WNT Summer Series that will also have the women national team of a host nation, United States of America, Portugal and Jamaica in attendance. Matches will be played at the BBVA Stadium in Houston and at the brand new $240 million Q2 Stadium in Austin, built by the newest club in the Major League Soccer, Austin FC, in both cities are uh, in the state of te Texas, and the clash between the Super Falcons of Nigeria and the U.S. Women A team will be the first ever football match at the State of the Art Q2. The Glamour Tournament, which also held in 2017 and 2018, will run between the 10th and the 16th of June. The training and matches will fall under comprehensive U.S. soccer return to play protocols and guidelines and in accordance with the CONCACAF return to play protocols. Everyone entering the controlled environment will be tested for COVID-19 before traveling upon arrival and periodically thereafter. Coming back to Africa now, Turkey could help Ghana prepare for its hosting of the African Games after a meeting was held between officials from both countries. Accra is poised to host the most sports event in 2023, but Ghana Olympic Committee, the GOC, the president Ben Nuno Mensa, has admitted facilities may not be ready in time for an effective 18 months for training and uh, preparation. And Mensa appointed Mohamed Mohadi, the third vice president of the GOC and the president of the Ghana Fencing Federation, as the head of an international re relations committee tasked with the forging links with more advanced countries. It is hoped these nations will open their sports facilities to Ghanaian athletes while signing agreements which will benefit both parties. Now, Mahadi met Nese Gundogan, the Secretary General of the Turkish Olympic Committee and a member of the Association of National Olympic Committee's Executive Council to discuss a tie-up with Turkey. And Ghana has never hosted the African Games before and won two gold medals at the last edition in Morocco 2019. Going over to the Olympics now, weightlifter Laurel Hubert is set to become the first transgender athlete to compete at an Olympics after qualifying for the rescheduled Tokyo Games due to a rule change. Hubbard was effectively guaranteed a spot in the women's super heavyweight category after the International Olympic Committee approved an amendment to the rules as the COVID-19 pandemic forced the cancellation of many qualifying tournament competitions. And the 43-year-old New Zealander has not yet been named to the national women's weightlifting team going to the Tokyo Olympic Games. Hubbard competed in men's weightlifting competitions before transitioning in 2013. And she has been eligible to compete in the Olympics since 2015 when the IOC issued new guidelines allowing any transgender athlete to compete as a woman provided their testosterone levels are below 10 nanomoles per liter for at least 12 months before their first competition. And moving over to Old Trafford now, talking about Manchester United, they face the nightmare prospect of a run of three matches in little over 100 hours in the coming week, culminating in their rearranged fixture with Liverpool. Their postponed home Premier League match against Liverpool has been rearranged for the 13th of May. Now the match was called off on Sunday after United fans protesting against the club's American owners. The Glazer family stormed into the stadium, which was closed to spectators due to COVID-19 restrictions. Now, the rescheduling of the game means United must play two games in the space of two days as their home game against Leicester City has been moved forward a day to the 11th of May. Now, United's penultimate league game at home to Fulham has been scheduled for the 18th of May, allowing the club to host a limited number of fans in line with the uh, government's plan to ease lockdown restrictions in England. But that's it on the spot update on the news today. I'm Udoka Njoko and I'm handing back to Benga Borowa. Thank you, Udoka. Now it's time for Entertainment Stories with Sam Dandy. The entire world was taken by surprise at the announcement that Microsoft's co-founder, Bill Gates, and his 27 years long marriage with Melinda has come to an end. The billionaires took to social media to share as well as ask for privacy in these times. Many fears came from the public's concern about their foundation and its immense contribution to the world. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the world, 
worth over $50 billion. As well, philanthropy within the African continent has benefited millions, focusing on public good and improvement of life. Towards encouraging the good cause, here are some Nigerian entertainers who have helped to improve quality of life. In 2012, Waje, Nigerian award-winning musician, launched her non-profit organization, Waje Safe House, to provide support to women and children across Africa. The Safe House first project was financial support to the children's primary school in the impoverished slum town of Makoko in Lagos. A medic, mental and environmental development initiative for children, called Project Help. Most recently, YJ Safe House partnered with women organizations in three cities in Nigeria to provide computer education and facilities to young and adult women. Davido. On one remarkable occasion, Davido gifted an Instagram fan, Jide Sanyolu, a token of one million when he needed money to return to school. That was more than enough to cover his tuition fees for the entire semester. More recent acts went viral as he gifted one million to a random fan identified as Deborah. She was given 500,000 cash and a balance was transferred into her sister's account. <laughs> Olajide announced his graduation from Afeba Balola University with first class honors and thanked the Nigerian pop star Davido via tweet for helping him with the money. Davido acknowledged his tweet with an appreciation message saying, Crazy happy for you. <laughs> Florence Ifeolu Otadola, popularly known as DJ Copy, launched her charity foundation, Copy Foundation, which she had been working on for a while since 2018. Copy started with helping people with disabilities with their university education. And in 2018, she had offered free education to three people, and all of them were offered admission into Unilag at 2018. Today, with major partners like Save the Children, Global Citizens, Aliko Dangote Foundation, among others, from 2019 till today, over 9,000 unique persons have been reached with the 5 billion naira raised in 2019. To support those that are most endangered in our society. Singer Banky W isn't new to philanthropy. He had collaborated with Haven Helping Hands Foundation to refurbish Home of God's Grace Orphanage in Ikorudu. In 2018, he joined Pink Oak to fight cancer. As a survivor himself, he made a strong commitment towards helping cancer patients in Nigeria. Most recently, following the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, Banky W hit the streets of Lagos to feed thousands. In collaboration with, Riz, in collaboration with residents of Lekki and the Lekki Food Bank, he fed over a thousand people, an initiative he took every day until the COVID-19 lockdown ended. 36-year-old Tuntu, Charity DK, is a Nigerian actress, singer, songwriter and humanitarian. On 27th of August 2000, Tonto Dike set up her foundation, the Tonto Dike Foundation. The foundation was centered on making life better for all displaced and underprivileged women, girls, youths, and children in Africa. Today, the foundation has over 20 active projects and has helped over 50,000 people. The foundation has also received a Global Impact Award and a United Nations Ambassadorial Award. We hail these entertainers and many more who haven't been represented on our list. Remember, philanthropy is important because it not only provides opportunities, but supports projects and endeavors that may be too unpopular or controversial to gain the widespread support of the general public or the government. Well, that's all entertainment news. I am Sam Dandy. New Central's weather desk has more for temperatures and participation to expect across Africa tomorrow. That's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's remind you of our top stories. Over 200 homes destroyed after rainstorms in Liberia Township. Nigeria's military chiefs have appeared before lawmakers over rising insecurity. And finally, we told you that the Ethiopian parliament has classified Tigray People's Liberation Front as a terrorist organization. 
Remember to follow us on social media. We're at News Central TV. You can also catch up with our news and programs. Just download the News Central TV mobile app on Play Store and iOS. You can also watch us live at Star Times Channel 274. Many thanks for watching. I am Benga Aburoa.